What's up, Wisconsin? Welcome back to the Inside Wisconsin Show here on YouTube and wherever you listen to podcasts. That's John Anderson. I'm Trevor Thomas. Today, we skirt a little bit away from what we typically do, but it's it's a welcome change. Our 2024 Packers draft preview episode. And if you're filling out your own mock draft, I don't know if you're getting any closer to who the Packers are going to pick. But uh, we have people who are both well-informed uh, in, in the ways of the Packers, in the way of the draft. And they're entertaining just about how the whole operation works and what that is now this, um, what has become literally this cottage industry of the draft. Shouldn't say that. Cottages are small. Like this is Newport, Rhode Island mansions. That that's going out, you know. There used to be there was Mel, and he got out his book every year, and now it's just it's exploded. It's crazy, and 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 I love it. I'm in. Like I want to know by the time it finally comes, you know. And it's people that just walk up and they hear, here's a name. That's <laughs> it. Walk up, and they know. Uh, and the Packers take Bill, and you're like, and yet that's the whole thing. You know, and then when the Jets announce whoever they're going to announce, they'll just boo. But, you know, it's crazy. And then they dissect every single one of these guys. And who's up first today? ESPN NFL draft analyst Field Yates. This guy could dissect. Well, you'll hear it. South Dakota, for God's sakes. Yeah, but and, and he's a guy that not only is he great for us and covers the game, he's kind of become more and more onto the draft side. Uh, but he's he is a football analyst through and through. And, you know, I worked for the Patriots for many years, worked for the Chiefs. So he's been inside draft rooms. He's been inside front offices. He's been um, around the game in locker rooms before he came to this. So he speaks with sort of an authority and a knowledge that is deeper than most because he's experienced almost all the facets of what happens in and around the game and in and around the draft and knows exactly how much goes into what is essentially R&D for a team that's going to pick, in the Packers' case, 11 times. You don't think they'll pick 11. I think they do. but You do? And all of it lives up here. 13 last year, dude. I don't know. I just think they're going to trade. We'll see. That's why we do it, and that's That's why it's such a big deal. That's what everybody loves. By the way, that's what I love. Some people, I just think they're going to trade. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> That's gut my feeling, analysis. Gut feeling we're going to move from 41 to 27. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why I do it. You, I do, and that's why I feel yeah. Yates. We are about to see. This is why he does it. All right, let's jump in. The 2024 Packers Draft Preview Show. The Inside Wisconsin Show is brought to you by American Family Insurance, Aaron's Company, Blaine's Farm and Fleet, Capital Credit Union, Festival Foods, Quick Trip, Miller Lite, North Star Mohican Casino Resort and the University of Wisconsin Platteville. Hey, remember to subscribe on YouTube, leave a review, smash the like button, just get with us. We brought out the big guns for the draft show, ESPN NFL draft analyst Field Yates. JA made a, a call in a favor. What's up, Field? Thanks for joining. It's great to be on with you guys. And when, as, as John said, when, when, when he asks, I like to answer the bell here. And it's an honor sure. to be on with you guys talking about all things NFL draft, Wisconsin, you name it. We can talk about favorite well, restaurants in the greater Hartford area. I'm here for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, well, I don't think we have time for West Hartford or uh, AK Weha in here right now. No, you say we want to try, we want to talk all things. We just want to talk the one thing. And we feel like with 100% accuracy, you'll just tell us who they're going to take at number 25. Well, I yeah, I was thinking about revealing it like a couple days later from right now, but fine, yeah. I'll do it at this moment. Um, <laughs> they're a fun team to figure out right now. So the Packers, one thing I will say about the Packers, and I'm not trying to cater to a, a crowd that I know has a great affinity for the Green Bay Packers, is that their primary needs align nicely with how I view the, the proverbial big board this year, right? So this is a team that I think has a long-term eye on the left tackle position. Rasheed Walker is certainly a sufficient, capable starter for just this year if they don't have an upgrade available on the roster. But at some point, you have to be looking for a left tackle upgrade, a team that has known the value of a terrific left tackle for a long time with David Bakhtiari and others that have preceded him. Also, on the defensive side of the ball, new coordinator, new scheme, and a couple of needs. I think we need to beef up the cornerback depth there in Green Bay, and I think you need one more safety plus a linebacker. So 
all of those positions, I think, do align with where they're at, both in the first round, 25, and then the two picks in the second round, starting with 41 via the Jets. And then is it 57, the last second round pick? Which 58, uh, man. If you're going to come on the yeah. show, get it Sorry. right. Come Dang on. it. <laughs> Not tidying up the details here. Uh, 58, <laughs> which I think is the sweet spot for where the safety run could begin. And while they did spend, obviously, big money on Xavier McKinney, still feels like with two notable safety departures this offseason, the Packers still need to find one more safety in the draft. 25 seems to me like it's just not a sexy spot, yeah. right? Like it's like, it, it's good and you can get somebody. And if they're a 10 year starter, it's fantastic, but it's just, it just, you know, here are all the bright names that are going to have the flash. And the, I, I don't know. How do I feel about just picking in that spot in the draft, which is listen, when you're good like them, that's where they've lived for a long time. Well, someone told me this was, was talking about a team that's been there uh, near the, the 30 to 32 range for quite some time. And they were saying like, one of the luxuries of being a really good team year over year over year is that in the first round, you can hit a lot of doubles and that's okay. Uh, we all want home runs, but you know, sometimes you realize that first round picks become strikeouts like pretty quickly, which is a problem in the NFL. So being in that 25 to 32 range actually affords you ability, the ability to find a player that like has a high floor. Maybe his ceiling isn't at high, as high. So the Packers could go that route. And there are some players that fill that category or that bucket, if you will. But I do think there are enough of like upside upside type prospects that also fill a need. And Green Bay mm -hmm. is in this unique situation because and I'll just cut to the chase of a player that I think could be on their radar pick number 25. It's Tyler Guyton, offensive tackle from Oklahoma. I'm sure you guys have discussed him. I know every Packers fan has thought about Tyler Guyton moving to Green Bay and uh, the potential and the upside and, you know, the physical traits. But the reality with Tyler Guyton, for a guy who's got one full season as a starter and not that many, like, cute snaps playing offensive line at the college level, he might need half a season, a full season to realize his full potential. But if the draft were simply done based off drafting for potential, he'd go much higher than pick number 25. So that, that could be an example of a player who falls a little bit lower than his talent suggests he could potentially be one day. But given the fact that he's green and there are some teams that are picking earlier than the Packers that may need to protect a young quarterback who needs immediate help, he might fall relative some, to some other pro-ready, if you will, offensive tackles who could hear their names called five, six, seven, ten slots ahead. It's no secret that Goody likes a lot of draft picks, though. However, I think there's a 100% chance that they do not pick 11 times. Do you move up beginning? Is it a, a shuffle at the end? What are your thoughts on that? Okay, so if the offensive tackle run that involves the guys who are a little bit more ready-made right now goes a little bit slower than I am currently imagining it, then I think the possibility of moving up a handful of slots from 25 to 20 or 18 or 16, something like that could certainly be addressed if you're the Packers. But I think staying at 25 has like you know has, has real appeal just because of the fact that if they don't move, they still could get a corner an offensive tackle. I think it's a little early for a linebacker. The best probably in this year's class is Edron Cooper, Texas A&M linebacker, who's got just off the chart speed. He was actually one of the best pass rushers in college football this past year. He had eight sacks. The guy was all over the place uh, for the Aggies during what was an otherwise disappointing season for them. He was kind of one of the few bright spots. Uh, but I think they can stay at 25 and still fill those needs. But if that run goes a little bit slower, which is hard for me to totally envision given the fact that so mm -hmm. many teams need offensive tackles. But in an unlikely scenario where guys like Olu Fashionu or Tali Fuaga start to slip a little bit, then I think that's when Green Bay can pick up the phones and start thinking aggressively. Can't wait for Caleb Williams to fall to 24, and they're going to be like, God, are we going to have to pick another quarterback? This is Again. Be come through. Uh, <laughs> given some of the places you worked inside the league when you were in, in uh, New England or Kansas City, like, I feel like that aligns to some degree with this Packers. They are draft and development kind of people, yep. which every time I hear that, I go, well, but that's a lot easier to cover a mistake than if you sign a free agent for a lot of money, right? Those are cheap mistakes to make. Okay, you blew it on a fifth rounder. Fine, we can get them going. Uh, just your, your thought and their philosophy and how they kind of go about business and have pre Goody to, um, um, Come on, give me the guy's name. My dad absolutely just despised Ted Thompson. Ted, Ted Thompson, who yeah, my dad was just, yeah. oh my goodness. Uh, you know, but just 
it's this is not just a one year thing. This is a team that has done this 30 years like this. Yeah, they have. Now, it feels like a little bit of a different version of the Ted Thompson Packers now that this team has gone big game hunting and free agency, Xavier McKinney recently, but even going back to the year they signed the Smith brothers, Adarius and Preston, and you know, they've, they've, they've made some splashes here that um, we were not accustomed to. I remember when it was, I think they signed Julius Peppers, and it was something like the ninth straight off season prior to that, that they had gone without signing an external free agent for more than like $3 million or some ridiculous, you know, number and streak relative right. to what we see from teams all over the NFL map. I mean, there are teams that every year feels like they're spending big in free agency, but if there's a team that right now, I mean, I think the answer is obviously the chiefs get to kind of puff their chests out, but Brian Gunick gets get, he gets the chance to like, to sort of say, I told you so to everybody out there, right? Because he followed a very specific plan last year. He said, we're going full on youth movement. We traded our quarterback, the four time MVP away for a package that, you know, it wasn't a terrible package. It's hard when you have that size of a contract and a quarterback who wants to go to just one team. And the fact that, uh, you know, draft capital is hoarded in the NFL. So, to not have a guaranteed first round pick was not to me like completely inexplicable by the Packers, but it was still a bold move, a roll of the dice. And Goody was willing to make that roll of the dice. His Jordan Love pick from three years prior worked out masterfully, even with a slow start that had me asking some questions about mm -hmm. whether the Packers maybe had some sellers remorse and moving on from Aaron Rodgers. But Brian Gunnikus has done an excellent job with this Packers roster as far as the blend of like I'm often saying, like, it's nice to have a handful of guys that you know you, you you've had around long enough that they are kind of the veteran, the old guard of the team. I want to say I saw this recently, and I'm pretty sure Preston Smith's like the only 30 plus year old in the entire roster. Like that's unheard of in the NFL, especially with a couple of positions, quarterback, punter, kicker, where like you see guys that are 30 plus all the time. So um, the Packers have definitely long been the draft and develop team. Goody's desire, interest and willingness to roll in some free agency every once in a while, I think has served them really well. And while you can't hit every single big investment you've made, it's been a while since the Packers did something that I would categorize as an absolute fail, like basically diminishing return on your investment from the moment the move was made. Maybe you guys can recall something that was more egregious than I am realizing right now, but they're on a pretty good heater. <laughs> you think you had questions at the beginning of last season? <laughs> Try living 10 minutes away from Lambeau Field. I not, uh, yeah. Oh. There were questions. Oh, I, I have a, I have like, it almost makes me sick to my stomach to, to reveal this. I've never been to Lambeau Field. I've been to, I believe, 30 of 32 NFL stadiums, and Lambeau is one of the two that I've never been to. Uh, and I look forward to making that change next year for the draft. But I want to go to a game. Like, obviously, I can't wait for the draft next year, but uh, it feels like football royalty. Like, I want to go to a game where it's not, I don't want to have like 12 inches of snow on the ground, but I want flakes falling at kickoff. I want, I want it to be a night game. I want it to be cold, not bitterly cold, but I'm looking for like 35 degrees with some snow at kickoff. That's all I'm asking for. Yeah, sure. We, I, I, we, we, what's the other one you haven't gone to? Uh, I have not been to the new Jerry's World. Oh, okay. That's yeah, right. Which seems pretty sweet. Yeah. It is, but it's it's the Cowboys, and they're all vain. No, by the way, you don't <laughs> yeah, want to go to an game. You you want to go to a, you want to go to a you want to go to a, a one o'clock kickoff. That's okay. Or noon start in Green Bay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you're a night game guy. Uh, yeah, all the, I, I'm an all the games guy, but yeah, night games is pretty are, absurd. You can tell you're 12 or however old you are. No, no you, you can tell I know a guy noon. with season tickets. You want to no. go to noon, game gets over, you go home, you get cleaned yeah. up, you go to a supper club that night. No, you know, that's just me. That does <laughs> sound like that. that's Wisconsin for you. I've only spent uh, my only experience in the, in the great state of Wisconsin was uh, when I was working with the Chiefs. Uh, I was there the last year or two that we did training camp in River Falls. Mm -hmm. What a lovely corner of America that place is. I mean, that is like, I've never met nicer people in my entire life than River Falls, Wisconsin. Oh, they were all awesome. literally my next question was, have you ever been to Lambeau Field? So, J.A., you're up. I'll think of something else. Well, I, no, listen, that's OK. Uh, we, we've touched on this with other people. I want to know, like, if, if Aaron Rodgers plays and the Jets go great, I still don't I'm not I was not buying their Super Bowl people. Yep. And so, like, there's a chance they could have had the 25th pick. Yeah, something like that. So they get they get the the forty first out of this. Uh, did they get fair compensation for him? Like I get if we just measure it against he played four snaps, but just in by and large, 
if you're making that deal and you're looking in the front office, you go, oh, we did all right. Yeah, I think so. I think they did all right for a few reasons. Is First of all, I think the most important part of the trade is that they're validated with their decision to take Jordan Love, right? By the end of the season, maybe this makes me a bad uh, sports media person these days. I don't have like the the energy to debate was Jordan Love a top five, top eight, right. top ten quarterback? I just know that he was a damn good quarterback by the end of the season. And the Packers now have their plan for the next maybe a decade, right? I mean, that seems to be the shelf life on these Packers quarterbacks. You give them 15 years, and then they draft your replacement by about year 12 or 13, and then you just move on, and that's okay. Um, so I think that was the most important part of it, is that if Jordan Love had played poorly, even if Aaron Rodgers had, even though he did have that four-play season in total for the Jets, if Love was no good, then people would be saying, I mean, separate, who cares about how long Aaron Rodgers was on the field for the Jets? We have a quarterback conundrum in Green Bay, but the fact that Jordan Love was so special for the Packers by the end of last season and did what he did in that playoff game in Green Bay. And then I'm sorry, in Dallas. And then they have the halftime lead over the 49ers and give them all they can handle against a team that obviously ended up playing in the Super Bowl and nearly won the Super Bowl. Uh, that to me was the most important dynamic of that trade, even if it wasn't a certainty at the time was the trade was made. I think back to this and I'm not blaming the Packers or Jordan Love for being amenable to it, but I think back to how fascinating it is the Packers last May, the beginning portion of May, rather than picking up Jordan Love's fifth year option, ended up doing that modified two year extension with Jordan Love, which, or I guess it was a one year extension, but it covered last year, right? In this this upcoming season, um, and it's it was an acknowledgement from the Packers that hey, like we, we still need to see a little bit more. We'd like to see something. I guess there was nothing for them to have seen by then. He had one start uh, before they had to make that decision. Meanwhile, from Jordan Love, it was a bit of a hedge, right? It was, mm -hmm. okay, so if they're not going to pick up my fifth-year option, at least I had more cash in my back pocket this year and next than if I bust in 2023, become a free agent, and all I can get is some backup quarterback money. So to me, uh, it's fascinating to think back just how different or just how much the perception of Jordan Love changed. It, even the Packers and Jordan Love himself acknowledge as much. I feel like also the thing about picking 25th here is it's sort of bust proof. Yeah. And I mean, like when you take Tony Manager at two and you don't, and you don't do well, you're like, Oh my gosh, he's terrible. The other, like I look at this, I always, this is my example and I'd love to hear your opinion on it. A.J. Hawk was a great player for the Packers, but he was picked fifth. If A.J. Hawk gets picked at 25th, we go, that might be one of the greatest number one picks they've ever had. Yeah. He got picked at five, so everybody's like, oh, I don't know if A.J. Hawk was ever quite what we thought. Yeah. Um, I feel like 25 gives you some insulation there as a GM. How many players, when we think about quote-unquote bust, come to mind that weren't in the first 10 picks? It's a great point because – you want to hit it, right? But the repercussions of missing on pick 25 are just so much greater than missing on pick five overall. And I'm sure the Packers hope to never again pick in the top 10. I, I suppose at some point, right. uh, you know, the circle of life will hit every NFL team. Uh, but yes, I totally agree with that. And, you know, I guess the only way in which it becomes a problem is if you're consistently missing when you're picking in the mid twenties or even the early thirties, but that means that you're doing enough other things correctly because you're still picking in the mid twenties or late thirties. So, but I would, the pressure is so much different. It's been fascinating to hear some of these GMs during the pre-draft uh, press conferences talking about how, you know, when we're picking at 26, 28, 30, 32, whatever it might be. You don't go into the exercise blind, but it's impossible for us to know what we think is likely to take place when we're on the clock, because we have no idea what picks one through 10 are going to look like much less 11 through 20. And however many picks there are prior to our selection in the twenties. So I think it just changes everybody's expectations, both prior to the pick and once the player is actually drafted. Yeah. I, I looked at, I thought, you know, if you ran 20, if you ran 10,000 simulations of the draft, yeah, like the bears, there's one thing that's going to happen. Yeah. If you get to the Packers, there's like 10,000 simulations and there's like 8,027 different possibilities of what 25 looks like. So you've been spending time on that new ESPN.com NFL draft simulator. I saw this from uh, one of the people that was re responsible for building it. Apparently, some Bears fan had taken the early lead, like within 12 hours, had already run like 424 simulations. And then after he posted that, some Lions fan 
some eager Lions fan took that over and is up to like 600 simulations. So that's the best part about the draft, though, is that wow. for the next seven days, we are going to be sitting here wondering what could, what might, what will happen. It's the ultimate, I guess, reality TV show, NFL NFL version. Do you I, had no idea we had that. I had no idea we had one of those things. So I'm going to go. Oh, it's great. It. It's a great time waster. But I mean that in an affectionate way. <laughs> yes, you're right. How often do you tap into your psychology degree with all this? Like you're reading minds for a living at this point. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I I would say that uh, my general rule of thumb, as we are this close to the draft, is to be dubious of everything that is not like a fact or not, you know, fact or fiction. Like you know, if it's if there's gray area at all, I'm dubious of it. Um, if someone calls me and says, "Hey," You know, such and such prospect sprained his ankle yesterday, just a heads up for you. I'm not going to discount the veracity of something like that. But when someone calls me and says, hey, you might want to check in on the Vikings, like I'm hearing they're really interested in this guy. I'm thinking to myself, what person from the Vikings that is in a position to actually make a decision on a player is going to let other people know that they're mm -hmm. very interested in that player? unless they are actually not at all interested in that player. So I've learned that up until like maybe a few hours before the draft and or maybe even not at all, I'm just kind of treading lightly on overall input. What I found has been more useful and like talking to people around the NFL is just sort of gathering several opinions on players and using if there is a consensus as a data point when I'm making my own evaluation or if there isn't a consensus, factoring that in, if I'm having a hard time ranking a guy and I've got five different people that say five very different things, it probably only solidifies that this player's range is a lot wider than most. And that's what I think people often overlook on the NFL draft is if, if there's a guy that we have 47th on the big board that goes in the top 10 picks, that's pretty unlikely to be something that most of the league agrees with. But once you get past, like, pick 25, 30 maybe, the, the 35th best player on the Packers board might be 90th on the Saints board. And it might be the opposite, right? You know, maybe the Saints have a guy that they love as the 35th, 38th best player, and the Packers have a third-round grade on him. That's the reality of having 32 different grading scales, 32 different systems, 32 different lead evaluators. Um, but we, and I understand why, I mean, I'm a part of this draft industry complex. You know, we want to grade players. We want to grade picks. We want to hand out home run hits and we want to hand out whiffs by NFL mm -hmm. teams when there are so many things that are completely out of our control and we're applying our rules to all 32 when the reality is that every team plays with a very different set of rules. So what they value in a player might be different than what I value in a player. And that could just cause an inherent lack of agreement on that. Mm -hmm. So you operated on the other side of this, though, right? Before you came over to the dark side with us, um, like this is the Super Bowl for scouts, right? Everybody's in the office, and this is their, like, this is their time, right? Like, like when those guys come through a building, do, like, is there a noticeable jump in the bounce in their step, or what do they like during this week? So what's nice about this week is that for the most part, the preparation's done, right? We've now turned over the leaf, and it's about being nimble and being able to react to what takes place in front of you. Because other than the Bears, everybody else has at least somebody in front of them. I suppose the, the commanders could feel really good about what they want to do, given the fact that we believe, right now, believe that it'll be Jaden Daniels going second overall to the commanders. Um, but other than that, like, you know, people, I think, every team is is preparing for, as, as you just said, whatever it was, 8,000 different simulations and opportunities that could hit the Packers when they get to pick number 25. But there is a bit of relief because for the most part, the preparation is done. A lot of teams have done a recent run of April draft meetings where they bring scouts from all over the country in and they'll go through the board, mm -hmm. both vertically and horizontally. What I mean by vertically is, hey, let's run through all the quarterbacks and make sure that we like you know, the order that we have them in and then horizontally is, all right, after you've gone through every quarterback and every running back and every wide receiver by position, you then say, OK, our top running back, is that better or worse than our top wide receiver grade wise? OK, so the wide receiver is rated higher. Well, then let's go to the second wide receiver, because if the second wide receiver and the top running back are both on the board and we have needs in each. Are we taking the second wide receiver over the running back or are we taking the running back over the wide receiver? So the horizontal nature of the board, I think, is often overlooked during the draft process, but it's something that teams have ironed out over the past couple of weeks. And now it's 
keeping your sort of ears open for any kind of intel you may get, whether it's real or not, and then just preparing for any scenario possible. Now contrast that with the chaos that you are in now at ESPN with draft specials. I saw the three round draft you did. You were on the ACC network in the middle of the night. Yeah. Sports center. Like it's my demo. Like, right. Like, I don't know. Other than when you're sitting here, is there a time when you are off TV in the next week and a half? I try to, I try to give my kids the, uh, like, like an hour in the morning. Oh, Sean, I don't even, I'm night. not going to believe that that's happening. I, I know. I'm trying. We're trying. <laughs> um, but however, the hope is that, you know, you sprint during this two or so week period where everybody wants to talk about the draft and then you exhale like May 3rd. It's not the day after the draft because we got to do those draft grades. Then you got to kind of push things forward a little bit. Now that I've processed it, okay, which pick do I think has the best chance for an immediate impact? Once you get that past, past that part of it, then you kind of exhale for a little bit. And uh, someone asked me recently if I if I, if I golf, and I said I used to because I, I think it's been over a year since I've actually had a golf club on my hand other than a plastic one because I had a 10-month-old who – so. Pretty much, you know, the last the home the home stretch there before she was born, there wasn't much golf. And then since she was born, haven't had much golf in my life yet. But I do think I'm going to rediscover the sport in a couple of weeks from right now, if Connecticut weather obliges. Well, that yeah, okay, good Which luck. Is always August. a big if, right? Yeah. Right there with the schedule release, and that'll ruin that day. Yeah, of course, that's what's going to happen. It's going to be 80 the day they release the schedule, which is the greatest. Like, if anything speaks to the the popularity of the NFL more than the schedule release, let me know because we know like. You guys, I'm, you guys could probably recite who the Packers are playing at home and on the road next year. The only variable we don't know is what week they're going to be playing these teams. And yet there is amazing interest in just filling out that one last piece of the puzzle. Plans have to be made. Plans have to be made. By the way, I do know the Packers are going to open in Brazil, which what the hell? <laughs> oh, I didn't even. <laughs> you guys should take the podcast on the road that week. That would be no. great. No. My Portuguese, my Portuguese is iffy at best. <laughs> you know what? I wouldn't put it past you to have some Portuguese on the ledger. Just telling you. It's just yeah. and remember that, people. If you're a Packer fan, they don't speak Spanish in Brazil. They speak Portuguese. Portuguese. Don't get crossed up by that. How so. many Packers fans are going to show up to Portugal with like um like a, a, a Spanish Rosetta Stone? Like, I got this, guys, no problem. I brought it with me. <laughs> Instead realizing it's Portuguese. These are these are people that put on carnival every year and are going to go like, I don't know that we've ever seen people like this before. <laughs> <laughs> and they've seen some stuff. They you certainly, yeah, certainly yeah. I am I pitching. Do. I am pitching to see if the Packers will let me go with Giselle and just see what the hell happens. Why not? That would be great content. Yeah, just me and Giselle hanging out. Too, right? <laughs> I'll yeah, teach her about great. the Packers. She can teach me about, you know, uh, the, the joys of Rio. But so far, uh, those calls have gone unanswered on, by, by many parties. But that's still my goal. That's ridiculous to me. Ridiculous that they would do that to you. Yeah. Not return your call? Show a little respect, will you? We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> Field, were you also at one time uh, directed to lose Aaron Rodgers' number, or do you still have that by chance? Oh, that so my my, my colleague Adam Schefter uh, did lose. I think he was directed yeah. to lose the number. Yeah. Um, I don't know that Aaron could pick me out of a lineup, which is okay. I mean, Aaron's <laughs> uh, got a lot of people in his life that I'm sure are pulling him uh, in many different directions. Uh, but that was a great moment. That was a great moment uh, when I'm trying to think, did Shefty reveal that or did Aaron say that publicly to America? I feel Shefty like Adam revealed made, it. Yeah. yeah. Shefty revealed it. And then Aaron was like, well, if we're going to screenshot some stuff, I'm like, whoa, whoa. This is <laughs> yeah, those are that, that's like an anxious few moments there when it's like, <laughs> what, what is he going to reveal if, next? Right. If I can just steer away from the Packers for a moment, which seems terrible. Uh, but in that division, you've got uh, the Bears are going to take Williams. The Vikings yeah. are going to find their way somehow to get to a quarterback. Uh, what are our draft hosts and division winning Lions What's what's on their what's on their dance card? Do you think? Well, first of all, they're picking 29th. This is like a, this is this is new territory for them. It's been a while, yeah. Um, which is a testament to them. But they need some help in the secondary. Uh, they needed help in the secondary going into the off season, and then amidst legal troubles, they cut Cam Sutton, who they signed to a three year deal for mm -hmm. decent money last year. Um, but they were going to need help there, so you can you can almost pencil that in as one of their first two or three picks. They need some pass rush help. They obviously have a good player in Aiden Hutchinson who had a great year this past season, but he needs some help, whether it's an edge rusher, whether it's an interior rusher. Uh, and then they probably need another wide receiver, which sounds crazy when you have Amon Ross St. Brown, who was a first-team All-Pro last year. 
first round pick in Jamison Williams, high scoring offense, but uh, that, that, and I don't want to react too much to just one game. There's a bit of a Mm -hmm. fool's errand involved in that, but as you guys recall, I mean, drops were essential to the 49ers beating the Lions in the NFC Championship game. Dan Campbell infamously went for it on fourth down, and he was aggressive, and it generated all sorts of opinions from every corner of people that have a platform in sports. Whether it was right or wrong, if a player makes a catch, we're not talking about it the same way. So um, they need more wide receiver help. They need some edge rushers, and they need a couple corners uh, not a bad, not a bad year to need some corners, by the way, just in general across the league. It, the, the depth goes from like an early run on perimeter corners to a decent run on slot corners. But I would say just generally speaking, you're going to find some value somewhere on that board. One more for me before we move on, because uh, he's busy cat field Yates. We talked about it earlier. The draft is here in Green Bay next year. There could be two feet of snow on the ground, and it could be 80 There's not going to be two feet on the sky. Come on. We know better than that. Hey, now we don't have to blame if there is, That's though. not all the time. That doesn't happen all the it time. It is not all the time. I'm just okay. saying it could be, and it's happened since I've lived here in Green Bay. We literally had two feet of snow on the ground right now, three, four years ago. It was stupid. It's Are melting. you excited for that? And what is it about the draft, I guess, that we talked about this a little bit earlier. Green Bay is a mecca by itself, right? And now bring the draft here. That's just different. It's just different than Detroit. It is. Um, You know, I guess I said earlier, I have great remorse about not having been to Lambeau Field before. Um, It's hallowed ground, though. And I'm not saying that just to cater to the audience here. It really is one of the most special places, uh, really, in all of football. And I'm going to take the lead from anybody that's been there. But, um, you know, I I love when, and he did it yesterday, and I thought it was, like, unbelievably awesome when Bill Belichick goes unfiltered. And he was talking, you know, he's talked about Lambo in the past. And just, I think it might have been when they did uh, joint practices either last summer or this summer with the Packers. At some point recently, the Patriots and Packers had joint practices. And when he is waxing poetic about the history of the organization and Lambo Field, I think that kind of speaks for itself. Um, but I think it's cool how the NFL has rotated the location of the draft. I loved Radio City for many, many years, obviously was the home. I think it was nearly 40 years consecutively that Radio City um, hosted the NFL draft. But what's been cool about the rotation of the cities is that every year it's been like a personal challenge to the subsequent host city to outdo the last one, right? So we've been to Chicago, we've been to Philadelphia, we've been to Nashville, and it's been like every year it's like who can show that last year's crowd was not as raucous as this year's crowd. Cleveland was also in there. I'm sure Detroit will be incredibly spirited. Uh, And I can't wait to see what, what, what green Bay is like. I mean, I'm sure there'll be a massive contingent of people from out of town, just given the, the total population of green Bay, which do I have it correct? It's like something like a hundred thousand people in the city of green Bay. 120,000. Yeah. Give or take. So yeah. So just like, yeah, it's a smaller metropolitan area, obviously than, than Detroit or Cleveland or Philly or any of those markets. Like I can't wait to see, what the complexion is. Is it just basically everybody in the entire state of Wisconsin there? Or is it, you know, the 120 Green Bay residents, 120,000 Green Bay residents, and then people from all over the map, which that, that'll be fun to see. Is Trev, is 120, is that like city proper or is that adding in yeah. the subs? So that's the kicker here. There's the greater Green Bay metro area, which is about the size of Madison. So Green Bay is yeah. 120,000 people, but this Northeast Wisconsin area is gigantic. Then bring everybody in from out of town, and that's why we're probably going to VRBO our condo. Let's be real. You, you, oh, say, smart you man. say gigantic, but gigantic, you mean like there might be 200 tops. Like, it's not that gigantic. Probably a it's half a mil. It comes through It's there. no weeha. It's no weeha, right, John? You know, it is not that for Big for us, okay? Sure. Big for us. I can't us. wait. Um, uh, I have this question because I, I thought, oh, I'm wearing my Wisconsin thing. Um, Braylon Allen. Uh, where's he goes? He, he good Fond du Lac kid. I feel like you know running backs. Their value is different than I remember. I I still can't yeah. get used to that. Uh, but I feel like he's he's going to go high to somebody that's going to get a pretty good player. Yeah, I think the range is probably starting somewhere in the third round. So Braylon's an interesting case. Coming into this past year, I would have said, you know, there's a chance he's the best running back in the entire draft class. Not that I need to explain this to you guys, but if there are people that are watching or listening that don't know all about the systems that were in place for Wisconsin this past year, I mean, Mm -hmm. this was not your father's Wisconsin Badgers football team, right? The offense was totally different 
Uh, I don't know how, if, if Tanner Bordellini, the center from Wisconsin, had ever shotgun snapped prior to this year. I'm being <laughs> a little bit facetious there. But right. that, this was a power run it down your throat between the tackles running scheme forever, right? Uh, so Braylon, who, as, as we all know, looks like the Incredible Hulk, was the perfect fit for that. Uh, this past year, it was was good, but it wasn't as dominant as it had been uh, earlier in his career, those first two seasons. He's 20 years old. It's the youngest player in the entire draft is Braylon Allen. So if there's a team that's looking for a power back, and I keep thinking about the Cowboys in round three as a potential Braylon Allen fit, that to me would be a reasonable spot uh, for him to go. I could see somewhere between like – Let's call it as soon as like pick 90 to maybe like 130 or so will be the range for Braylon Allen, somewhere in that in that territory. Better chance of getting drafted. Um, Tanner Mordecai or me. <laughs> uh, how many years of, of eligibility do you have left at the college level? Because I want to see if we should instead send you back for nope, nope, months. I can't. They, they don't they don't have the nil money to afford me anywhere. I know, God, I know it's um, amazing. New era, man. Hey, next year we're gonna have at some point soon. We're going to have this massive draft class. I saw the giant GM Joe Shane say, and part of it's the COVID year. So these guys all had an extra year of eligibility. But part of of it's the reality of NIL. They had 170 players they had draftable grades on. They had grades on that went back to college this past year. 170. So the the landscape's just so different. Guys are saying, why be a fourth-round pick when I can stay in school and make half a million bucks Mm -hmm. from whatever, the local Mercedes-Benz dealership? So at some point, those compensatory ticks, picks, fourth, fifth round, like those are going to be super valuable. Right. Those are There's going to be something that comes with that. So that'll be fantastic. Uh, all right. Well, I'm sure there's three people you don't know about yet in D3. Uh, so, you know, <laughs> we'll let you catch up. There might be a guy at UW Oshkosh that you need to study up on. Yep. And uh, to think we, of any, uh, any small school guys up there in Wisconsin, not as many, you know, there are quite a few in that, that region, you know, both, the, both the Dakotas, which is not right next to Wisconsin, but not you know, at close. all close. Not even. Yeah. Our- <laughs> <laughs> well, from someone who's lived his entire life, basically in the Northeast, North Dakota sounds closer to Wisconsin than uh, it does right. like, you know, West Weehaw, Connecticut. Right. Uh, like if I'm just, am I just going to go like, I know you spend time with Wesleyan cause that's just like being going to school in Vermont. You tell okay, me. Okay. Right. Okay. Now I get it. Well, I was going to say this is that like they're uh, I think we call it the Great Plains region is what yes. some scouts will do. And they'll have as far west as the Dakotas. They'll also have as far north as Minnesota, you know, Wisconsin, and then down to like Iowa, Nebraska. So to me, sure, the scouting voice, the scouting minds, I should say, is telling me that, you know, close enough. So you I'm claiming leave. the Dakotas for you guys. You and Levy. It's all the same place. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Us, you know, Levy's Long Island, but close enough. Us Northeast guys, you know, like. We have simple-minded brains. I'm just saying. But unless it's Ohio State and Michigan, and you guys somehow can sort those out, but Wisconsin <laughs> and Dakota are the same thing. Yeah, what are you, you're killing me, Whitey. Unbelievable. Well, Levy, I mean, he's probably been to a North Dakota hockey game at some point, right? Like, Yeah, he probably has. He's more a D3 guy. He's up there in Oswego. He'd know where yeah. St. Norbert's is yeah. uh, there in, in Wisconsin. That's what he'd know about. For yeah, sure. St. Norbert's a special place. All right, man, uh, go go be on TV with all the rest of those people, and we will see you, and uh, then we'll see you for sure uh, for the big three days in Detroit. Thanks so much for your time, Field. Appreciate it. Man. Thank you, guys. Talk to you soon. The Inside Wisconsin Show is brought to you by American Family Insurance, Aaron's Company, Lane's Farm and Fleet, Capital Credit Union, Festival Foods, Quick Trip, Miller Lite, North Star Mohican Casino Resort, and the University of Wisconsin Platteville. Hey, remember to subscribe on YouTube, leave a review, smash the like button, just get with us. Pump up the savings with Festival Foods Gas Rewards. How does it work? Simple. Grab your card in store, register online, get points for every grocery run, then roll up the Quick Trip and watch the prices roll back. Festival Foods Gas Rewards. Time for another Inside Wisconsin Top 5 list presented by Wisconsin's leaders in STEM, the University of wisconsin Platteville. UW Platteville's Environmental Science and Conservation Program prepares graduates to lead innovation in sustainability and agriculture and conserve environmental resources right here in Wisconsin. Find out more at uwplat.edu. I can't spell half of the words I just read, but go to Platteville and you'll have it all in your quiver. Perfect for you. All right. Top can five list spell, time. Can you spell STEM? S-T-E-M, although it's You're one good. of them uh, deals that it stands for something. It's not STEM itself. It's like NASA, you know? In an acronym? An acronym? 
Oh, in an, an acronym, yes. No, it's just an acronym. an acronym. I stuttered. An Science, acronym. technology, engineering, and math. Boom. There you go. All of which are applied to the draft and makes and none of it actually works. <laughs> yeah, but they do apply it 100%. Right. They apply all of it and then none of it works because then they're like you. They've got all this and then they go, but my gut says we should take uh, Andrews Carlson in the sixth round. That'll work out perfect. <laughs> yeah. <whoopsie. laughs> One of these days I'll get over that. I just don't know exactly. Not yet. Oh, my gosh. All no. right, John, you're up. What's the top five list this week, man? Uh, we're going to go top five obscure. Packer draft picks. Everybody knows Tony Madridge, right? Mm -hmm. Even if he was down there in the 20, everybody knows Aaron Rodgers, you know? Yeah. Who else? Who else is great that we, that we know that they took in the first round? The first round picks? Belaga was a first round guy. AJ Hawk, right? We, we, we know those guys all the time. Uh, I'd name all the, the wide receivers we did in the first round, but I don't know that there's any of those that go through. Juwan Walker. Yeah. Yeah. And he had one really good season. Yeah. One, and then that was the end of that. So, um, so these are guys that uh, people might know, didn't know they became Packers. They are Hall of Famers that people are like, wait, that he wasn't a Hall of Famer for the Packers. Uh, there's guys that people I don't think I've ever heard of. So there's a there's some honorable mentions always like the old Bears coach Dave Wanstead, famously drafted by the Packers. Oh, yeah, I don't know right. if you knew that in 1975, didn't make the team when the Packers won Super Bowl two and beat the Raiders, you know, their coach, their quarterback was the great Daryl LaMonica, the mad bomber. Uh, the Packers actually picked him in the 12th round, but he went to the AFL instead. So uh, we're going to go with number five. You tell me what you might know or not know. Uh, right. You ever heard the name Russ Letlow? Nope. So this guy was a first round pick, seventh overall, went to two Pro Bowls. You don't know him? What year? Well, he was their first ever pick in 1936. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it. So, so slightly before 1983. Yeah, yes, that's the first Packer uh, pick ever uh, from San Francisco, oh. Russ Letlow, and was a pro bowler in 38 and 39. I didn't even know they had a pro bowl in 38 and 39. <laughs> but, but you figure if you get a guy that's your first pick, seventh round, and he gets two pro bowl, like that's probably not a terrible pick. That's a good pick. Right? I think we're good with that. Uh, number four is Jim Burrow. Defensive oh. back out of Nebraska back in 1976. They picked him in the eighth round. He played three games and then went to Canada. Is he a dad? He's a dad of a famous Burrow. Right. So Jim Burrow is Joey, Joey, uh, Jackpot Joey's dad in Cincinnati, Joe Burrow. That's so awesome. that's why he's on my list. Number four. We love him. Uh, number three is a great Hall of Famer, Buck Buchanan with the Chiefs. And I had no idea. And Lombardi picked him in the 17th round in 1962. And then they nullified the pick and they reclassified him. And so he was drafted again in 63. And then everybody, wow, that guy's super good. And they what? ended up with the Chiefs and in the Hall of Fame and played against the Packers in Super Bowl one. But the Packers actually drafted him in 1962. How do you nullify a pick? What's that? I don't know what it is. I talked to Burt Bell or whoever was the commissioner in 62. I, I'm trying to think. <laughs> had uh, had uh, Pete Roselle taken over yet then? I, I'd have to look. But anyway, so <laughs> Buck Buchanan, one of the all-time great defensive linemen, could have been a Packer. Sounds like he was for a second. In 62. Instead of playing against him, they could have gone after him. Should have been amazing. Uh, number two, I know you've never heard of Charlie Choo Choo Brackens. I have it. You're right. What? He was the 16th pick in 1955. Here's what's amazing. He went to Prairie View A&M. He was the first uh, quarterback drafted from a historically black college university. First HBCU quarterback drafted in the NFL. And the Packers drafted him in 1955. So that was back when rosters were – this is amazing. We think, oh, 53. We, that's back when rosters were 33 dudes. Oh, my God. Wow. Which means he played in a bunch of games as a kicker, uh, but he he got in and threw two passes um, in a game. And I didn't know this. This is where we're going to get Cliff Crystal on the Packers story at one time. Uh, but I was looking at him because I knew they had drafted Charlie Choo Choo Brackens as an African-American quarterback and this first guy from Prairie View A&M. Uh, but a, according to Cliff, so he, he gets in the game, they're getting wiped out by the Browns. 
and he throws two passes. And then the next week they go to Chicago. He breaks curfew and they cut him. What? Get out. Wow. Charlie didn't make it through the whole season. 16th round pick in 1955, Charlie Choo Choo Brackens in the College Football Hall of Fame. And number one. Is the most bizarre story, I think, not just of any Packer draft pick, but maybe in NFL draft pick period. And it's an ugly story. So we think of the worst pick the Packers probably ever made was Tony Mandridge at number two. Right. And it made it worse because Barry Sanders was number three and he went to the home. Yeah, yeah, that hurt worse. Yeah, that's what it is. Randy Woodfield was drafted in 1974. He's drafted in the 15th round, right there with Wanstead. Wanstead was picked in 74 as well. The difference is yeah. Wanstead didn't make the didn't make the squad and went on to be a really great college coach and a really great NFL coach as an assistant and led the Bears. Randy Woodfield, who was drafted in 74, also in the 15th round. Um, all he turned out to be was a serial killer. Oh, you've talked about this before. That's right. Like, that's legit. So he went to Portland State, and he was kind of oh, creepy man. there. He comes to Green Bay. He goes through training camp, and then they kind of maybe, they don't know what they knew and didn't know, was that he kind of had this propensity to like to go and expose himself. And that was – so they kind of quietly ran him off. He played on a semi-pro team the next year or that year in – like Oshkosh or somewhere, stuck around. And eventually that didn't go well. And he became like, he kind of became a little notorious for being this perverted guy. And he goes back to Portland. And then there's this series of brutal killings in Oregon. They called him the I-5 serial killer. They finally nab him and convict him. They don't know, they convict him for a couple of things. It turned, They think he may have killed like 44 people. Jeez. Right. Like, I don't want to dampen the show here, but I don't know if people knew that. I had no idea. This guy, Randy Woodfield, a uh, huge article in Sports Illustrated. You have to go to the archives to find it. But it is fascinating Wow, that the Packers, clearly unbeknownst to them, because, you know, we do our research some, but it's the, the serial killer part usually doesn't show up in the combine or yeah, even. Not- in the yeah. The Packers at one point, worst pick ever, most obscure and the least. The Packers drafted a serial killer one time. And all of a so, sudden, Tony Mandrich doesn't look that bad, does he? Seems like he's okay. And yeah. Andres Carlson, all is forgiven for missing a few field goals. Like, this was a bad dude around. Nobody had an idea how bad a bad dude is. And then, of course, then the mental health goes and, it, it you know, it spirals. But it's just, yeah. So where you have Charlie Choo Choo Brackens, who didn't make it because he, he missed curfew, what was historically significant. Then you have this guy who is a monster. And uh, is is crazy. Added, added to the is, list of questions of making a pre-draft visit. So, how tall are you? How do you feel? Everything hurt? And oh yeah, have you killed anybody? Like right? Jeez. Yeah. All right. Well, better luck with this draft. I, I would think that they'll be better. I don't yeah. think that you know there's that, but you you never know, right? Like I don't think the Patriots knew that Aaron Hernandez was going to no. go over there. So like you, you never know, right? We we do a great bunch of height, weight, speed. We do the Wonderlick test in some cases and you visit with people all you know, but I don't think that stuff, it's it's hard to tell when that stuff's going to come around. So not on the list. I can't wait for old Matt Heller to, or Mike Heller to uh, follow that up. Good luck. Yeah. <laughs> Who we drafted, Mike? Tell us. The Inside Wisconsin Show is brought to you by American Family Insurance, Aaron's Company, Blaine's Farm and Fleet, Capital Credit Union, Festival Foods, Quick Trip, Miller Lite, North Star Mohican Casino Resort and the University of Wisconsin Platteville. Hey, remember to subscribe on YouTube, leave a review, smash the like button, just get with us. So have Miller Lite will travel. We've talked about this before. Wisconsin Packer fans, we travel well, and including apparently going to Brazil in week one. Yep. I don't think we can bring our own Miller Lite, though. I don't, I don't know. think that's going to be a thing. I, yeah, the, I, check it. Can you check it? Can you check beer? N- no. No, I don't know that. I don't know that. Um, if this is where we're going, I think that's a hard thing. The whole import tax, the whole you can't carry it on. Don't know that you can put it in your luggage. I think that might be. We're going to have to hope that they have some um, on hand because I don't yes. know that we're going to be able to help them out. You know? So the kicker. Don't but you used to work for a distributorship. You should know this. We were here. We don't distribute it. Funny. 
Brazil wasn't on my list of clients to call on. It okay, was well, more, I don't know, the greater Green Bay metro area, which is huge, by the way. So where I'm going with this is Miller Lite keeps it simple. And when we travel for Packers games, whether it's Nashville this year, I'm going to that. I'll tell you about that in a little bit. But we know it's going to be there, I guess. And obviously, we can have it delivered, too. But at the end of the day, I remember being in Vegas last year. I don't think they carried Miller Lite in the Vegas stadium until the Packers were coming. And I've had that experience with other places I've gone. You talk about being someplace and they brought a pallet of Miller Lite in. I mean, I guess that's at the end of the day, I'm just saying when we travel this year for Packers games, I'm talking directly to these away stadiums. Just be ready. I've heard so many, oh, we ran out. We didn't know you we were coming. Yeah, you did. It's not our fault anymore. Okay, we're coming, and just be ready for us. Stack it up. Load yeah. up. Seems fairly simple. That's all the whole people idea. for you. Maybe make a phone call to Lambeau Field. See what kind of, you know, we can figure it out. You know, you don't need quite and that much, but, you know, we'll just do don't call you because apparently you're great in Rhinelander, but at Rio, you got no shot. Or maybe in Marinette, you knew you know how to do it, but not elsewhere. It's not so much about responsible consumption in one evening or one game day. I think they're massively impressed by just how many days in a row we can do this. And they're not prepared for the length of time over the course of three, four days. It's just they're prepared for one day, and it turns out we're better than that. Anyway. Uh, it's like it's like in the movie um Moneyball, where Brad Pitt and the scouter, he's trading some guys. He's like, I can do this all day. <laughs> I can do this all day. And by the way, we'll come back tomorrow and do more. Mm-hmm. You don't have to choose what's best. Miller Lite has great taste and is less filling. Tastes like Miller time. To get Miller Lite delivered right to your door, visit MillerLite.com slash Inside Wisconsin, or you can find it pretty much anywhere that sells beer. Celebrate responsibly. Miller Brewing Company. Milwaukee, Wisconsin, 96 calories per 12 ounces. Fewer cows and carbs than premium regular beer. All right, I'm going to leave you with this story. We oh, went yeah. to Vegas last year. I talked about this, right. and we went out there for the Packers game, right? Uh, the, the last day, I think we were there. And my wife and I both walked out of Planet Hollywood. I think it was 10 in the morning, 11 in the morning, Vegas time. And we each had one of those tall boy 24-ounce Miller Lights. I don't think I replenished that one in here. People looked at us like we were crazy, even though we were in Las Vegas. And then they saw on my shirt, inside Wisconsin, and they're like, got it. No judgment. We get it now. Yeah. If you're wondering what's inside Wisconsin, it's Miller Lights. what's inside. By the way, you said this was last year? Yeah. Oh, was it technically this year? No, I'm just saying, because you said you came out of a planet Hollywood, so I thought maybe it was 1997. That's a great... We'll argue about that a different day. And joining us now, the host of the Mike Heller Show on the Game Radio Network across Wisconsin. That's Mike Heller himself. With hey, little... what's up, Mike? <laughs> how are you guys? Good to see you. I liked how you looked over the shoulder, mate. Like yeah. there was somebody else in the room that we were talking <laughs> about. <laughs> yeah. uh, I guess it's awesome. just me. It's just me. So, uh, <clears throat> boy, I have a lot of things I want to get to, but the first one is it has absolutely nothing to do with the Packers. A player who they might pick is just, I feel like um, um, you're not a 22 year old guy where you grew up in the draft That's was true. a thing. Like, are, did you ever think in your life that you would see a draft that had to be three days, nationally no. televised, the tourist destination, that you would spend how many hours on your show? It's stunning to me. And all yeah. we're doing is picking players. Never, never in my in my wildest imagination did I think this would become a made for TV and destination event ever. Uh, you know, you, you look back at the old videos when Pete Rozelle is picking up the phone in a conference room at a hotel, you know, off somebody's lobby and, and making the phone call to somebody. Mm-hmm. Yeah, extraordinary w- what they've done. And also extraordinary to think that a year from now it's going to be in Green Bay proper mm-hmm. and uh, and pulling that off. And it's a, it's almost as big as hosting a Super Bowl, which is never going to happen in Green Bay. But the draft coming to Green Bay is the equivalent of doing something just like that. Yeah, and we'll get to get to that here down the road. Yeah, because like I miss, like you said, Pete Rizzo, like I miss guys smoking sure, and yeah. <laughs> regular old phones. <laughs> like like even now they can't do that, right? Like, hey, guys, yeah. whatever you do, no cigarettes. And, and, and am I correct? Like, and the audiences eat it up. Like we can't get enough of it out there, which is yeah. also staggering. Right. Yeah. And the, the lead up to it, all of this 
coverage, uh, even the talk we're going to have today, but all of them and the, the people that spend a, an entire year to prepare to be asked to be on podcasts and radio shows and TV shows <laughs> this week and next. And then it begins the whole process for 2025. Yeah, it's a whole cottage industry. Yeah, I have buddies that treat it like the NCAA tournament. Like, how's your bracket? They're like, okay, so I have my first mock. For, like, what are you doing that you have yeah. a mock first round? Yeah. So all that out of the way, here's what I want to know coming in. This is like my overarching question for everybody. It's like, how much more trust do I feel or Packer fans feel in Goody now after last season and the love thing than they might have 12 months ago before that draft? Yeah, not only is it Jordan Love, it's the entire draft class from last year that all contributes um, statistically and in winning games when they mattered. Now, if you look back in some previous drafts, there's not all of that Love slash success. But mm -hmm. I think Goody's, Goody's living high right now. And what, they've got five in the first 100. They got 11 picks overall. I think Brian Gutekunst is um, he, he has a lot in his corner right now. He's banked a lot of equity in what he's done with the draft. And this team has specific needs. I'm sure we'll get into some of that. But overall, this roster is in a pretty good spot to actually supplement in what they're going to do in the draft uh, to make themselves co-favorites in the NFC North, if not more. And let's be honest, though, watching the draft, there will be a shakeup. We're not picking 11. We, listen to me. The Packers Correct. are not picking yeah. 11 times. That's not happening. No. So I do we move the, up, yeah. down? What do you think? Yeah, and that's one of the interesting things, because where are they going to go? This is not a great offensive line draft, but the Packers have a specific need at tackle. Uh, Zach Tom is solid at right tackle, and Rasheed Walker did a really good job filling in, stepping into that role a year ago. The question that I guess none of us know, and Brian Gutekunst and Matt LaFleur and their staff, they know it, but they're not going to tell us, is whether they think Rasheed Walker is their left tackle to play for the next number of years or if they are going to spend some draft capital in that. So if they take their you know, number 41 in the second round, number 25 in the first round, do they want to – move use that draft capital to go up into the top 20 uh i, I think that part is really intriguing to what goody's going to do he's you're right trevor he's not drafting they're not making 11 picks where they sit in the draft they're going to move uh in some draft capital and, and take advantage i don't know i think i see i can see them standing pat just because i don't know what's out there sure. a that high to move up for alignment and b the history of so many linemen is, you know, third round success. Yeah, Bakhtiari's that guy. Or, yeah, or, you know, we've uh, centers that they've just taken free agents wise. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, everybody's seen that. The key to most line play is like if you can just get five guys that play together for 17 games or for yeah. three years, it doesn't seem to matter where they are. Once they kind of learn to square dance together, yeah. it's, it's that deal. If I look at, you mentioned the 41 pick. Um, have I gotten fair compensation for Aaron Rodgers at 41? <laughs> well, you certainly got fair comp for what he did a year ago. Sure. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. For what, what Rodgers is going to end up doing, I, none of us know what he's going to do uh, for the Jets. Yeah, yeah, I, I mm -hmm. think so. I, I, I think the Packers won, not only, it, regardless of the Rodgers injury a year ago, I think the Packers were going to win that trade because of how Jordan Love was going to play. And and we didn't know how Love was going to play. I'm talking about it now knowing how Jordan Love played a year ago. The Packers won the trade. There's just no doubt about it. They stay out of the drama business that Aaron Rodgers lives in. I love Aaron Rodgers, the quarterback, and I don't, I don't disagree with everything he says in, from the dramatic department. However, it's good to move away from that. And Jordan Love was everything you could have wanted – a first-year starting quarterback in the NFL to be. He, he struggled a little bit. Growth is not linear, so he did. He bumped around a little bit, middle portion of the season. His second half might have been the best second half of the season of any quarterback in the NFL a year ago. Statistically, it was. Um, and he did it as a leader without drama. He doesn't make a – he's not a great soundbite, by the way. I guess, we, you know, like in our industry, uh, it, it's not a must-carry press conference – 
when he has it and he doesn't do it as a press conference. He does it in the locker room as well. Um, yeah, I think the Packers won, John. Is that a long-winded answer to a pretty simple question? I'm just wondering if it was fair. And part of the reason I ask that is he's 41. We They, they trade yeah. the pick. He's a second round. They get a comp pick for Alan Lazard in the fifth round. And he's 168. And I'm thinking if Aaron's 41 and Lazard is 160, I feel like there's more than 127 players difference between those. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, that's fair. So yes. Maybe I just feel like the Lazard thing for a fifth rounder is – yeah. Uh, you know, I don't know who's handing out the comp picks in New York, but like, I think those guys might have aired. Yeah, right. they could be. <laughs> Let's talk to them. Yeah. When he comes to somebody horse. there on the show and see what uh, they can do. I do feel like this has the potential to somewhat be boring for the Packers because just offensive linemen are not sexy. Right. You know, we had one once. Tony Manders was a sexy pick. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I don't know that Bulaga was sexy or. Iowa. Um, Iowa. All the all the great Hawkeyes that we had. Um, um, Ron Hallstrom was not a sexy sure. pick. Yeah. Uh, Ross Verba was not a sexy pick. I'm just trying to think of Iowa offensive linemen. Yeah. You know, but people they, really they want superstars, and you're like, no, what you really need is, you know, you need linemen and corners, and that's not always um, the greatest deal. Which I can't wait for that to happen when people, because then they're going to go right at it, because everybody knows they could pick the right guy. Well, and they've done so well. You mentioned it earlier with the middle round draft choices. I mean, David Bakhtiari is one of the best offensive linemen they've had in the last uh, 20 years. And he's not a first day pick in the draft. People just forget that he came out of Colorado and there was no ballyhoo when they, is that the right word? There was no reaction when they (laughs) selected him, but he turned out to be fantastic. And I would argue this about Bakhtiari. If he doesn't have the injury, I think he's going to wear a gold jacket. And I think he's Sterling Sharp-ish in the conversation of a gold jacket because I think he was the best left tackle in football for a, a few mm-hmm. of those years. His It's just I don't know that he'll play again. I think he would still like to try. But he might be an interesting conversation down the road. He's certainly a Green Bay Packers Hall of Famer, but I think he's got a Sterling Sharp shot at being considered for the Pro Football Hall of Fame given what he did. So we're talking about needs, right? And who was good and who wasn't. Yeah, I listened yeah. to the Mike Keller show yesterday. Oh, and I, boy, I heard sorry. Wayne Larvey tell us all who we need. And then I read an article from Rob Domofsky, and it doesn't match what Wayne Larvey thinks we need. So <laughs> who do we need? Yeah. Um, so because they switched to the 4-3, there's a need, right, at linebacker, I think, for – I think they really like Quay Walker – um, but Quay's got to, he's got to take that step as, as a linebacker. But I, I think Green Bay in the switch with Jeff Halfley's defense linebacker is a specific need. And I know Wayne said on the show yesterday, safety. Yeah. Yeah. You were, John, you were talking about Iowa. Cooper DeGene is everybody's, uh, in vogue conversation yeah. when it comes to a safety and somebody who can make a difference in different ways as being a playmaker. And, and this is probably unfair, but the Green Bay Packers haven't had great success um, with Iowa and a defensive back. Unless you go back, Micah Hyde was really good. And I, I thought it was a mistake. As it turns <laughs> out, his career in Buffalo, don't you wish it was all in Green Bay? But Cooper DeGene would require you almost certainly to move up in the first round, and I'm just not so sure. So I think linebacker, offensive line, and yeah, I think they need some help in the secondary, but those are the three specific needs for me. And the one thing I would bring up, Trevor, is that on the offensive line, what they lack right now is depth. Last year they had it, but Runyon's gone. Um, you know, David didn't play last year, but Runyon was a, a fairly important figure in that mix. They, they need some... They need some depth on the offensive line. And that's boring, right, John? But that's yep. probably what they'll need to do. But that's – I have written down here, like there's positions of need and then there's where do you add depth. Like those are two yeah. really different things but equally yeah. important kind of things. Sure, we got to plug a hole, but especially on the line, you know, like nobody just hears the five guys and they play every yeah. single snap. you got to have six, seven, eight of those guys to go through. Um, is it nice to have people not call you or have people – um, um, just sh- rattling your cage. Like, when will they draft a wide receiver? Like, I feel like people are like, okay, 
we don't have to have a first round wide receiver. This like if that's off the board yeah. this time. They, they like don't need to question. sign one. They don't need to draft one, right? They, I mean, Bo Melton, we had, I was talking to Donald Driver on my show the other day, and Bo Melton's wearing his number. Bo Melton wasn't somebody anybody thought of all last year until the end when number 80, Bo Melton, was making a splash because of other injuries. Yeah, I mean, there's a, probably a likelihood that they'll still take a sixth or seventh round. What do they have? They have two seventh round, two sixth mm-hmm. rounders and two seventh round picks. Maybe one of those is a wide receiver. But, no, nobody's calling a show, John, and saying, hey, when are they going to spend a first-round draft choice on a wide receiver? Well, it's not now. <laughs> are they? I was, oh, are they happy, do you think they're happy behind Jordan Love? Because that's a huge question for everybody all the time. I thought Clifford was fine, but it's, you kind of don't know. Yeah, um, because last year when they were doing it, there was a lot of – rhetoric a lot of conversation around green bay needing to go out and get a veteran somebody had been in the league a 30 something to be jordan loves backup they didn't do it uh and then you know sean clifford and you won't be surprised to hear this but we had people calling the show in october when jordan love was struggling a little (laughs) bit and saying well you got Sean Clifford right there. Why don't you give Jordan Love a little mental break? And <laughs> you know, people, um, I don't know if, if Clifford is the answer. And I don't think, John, you've been doing this a while. I don't think you know until you see him in a game, game, mm-hmm. not a preseason game, not in training camp, certainly not in OTAs. You'd have to see him based on necessity in a game that matters and then see how well he plays in that moment. Otherwise, you don't know. So you mentioned at the top, right, that the draft is coming back here. Ne- back. It's going to be here next year, right? Somebody this yeah. week asked me if I was going to the draft in Detroit, and I'm like, absolutely not. I, I don't have any desire to go to the draft. Right. Yeah. But a couple hundred thousand people do uh-huh. when it's here next year. Are we ready for that? What's that going to look like? I don't know. So the question about are we ready for it, the Ryder Cup was at Whistling Straits, what, three years ago now in 21? I think we handled that pretty well. The U.S. Open was at Aaron Hills. I think we handled that pretty well as far as an influx of lots of people. I don't know that there will be as many, or there were as many at the Ryder Cup, certainly from a number standpoint. I think it was 35,000 a day. So we're talking about a lot more than that. Is there going to be a cruise ship anchored just outside of Sturgeon Bay with all the (laughs) rooms for, you know, and then they run shuttles from Sturgeon Bay or Egg Harbor, Fish Creek? coming down to to green bay for the draft days are people airbnb in stevens point and wausau and okano and you know parts unknown eagle river and antigo and then bussing in on the i have no idea yeah i think everything infrastructure wise will be ready i don't know where people stay who are the people john do you know who the people are that go to the draft I Why don't. I just know that I've I the rental property I have in Pound, Wisconsin. I have there jacked you know. up the rates like you wouldn't believe. Pound, <laughs> <laughs> Wisconsin. That's, that's there I, again. That's the same thing. But here, what I think makes it even crazier, and maybe I'm just torn, and I think too much of of my hometown. Uh, like I don't know that I'm going to Detroit. The draft, yes, but beyond that, I don't know. If it's in New York. Let's go. And then, honey, we catch a show. We go to Chicago. Yeah. Things. yeah. There's not a lot of other things in Green Bay to do, but I, I think people might think this is my pilgrimage chance. Sure. Yeah. And so I think there might be this influx of people, even on top of what they usually get, just to say, I got to go see this place. Yeah. And, and, and the, so one I of the think, curiosities is where yeah. it's going to be in the stadium, yeah. too. Will they utilize the stadium or are they going to utilize? Um, Rush Expo and and out that way, or are they going to utilize um, you know Title Town District? Which of those is going to be where you have players preparing to walk out on the stage? Is it the big Oneida Gate steps on the east side of the stadium, looking up you know over at Nitschke Field yeah. and Rush Expo? There's so many unknowns, and then you know you can look now. There's no way it's going to be a precursor. But go ahead and look now at the extended forecast of what next week looks like in Green Bay, mm-hmm. because that's your time frame. And somebody had said last year when they when they announced this, you know, what if it snows? I said, if it snowed, it would be perfect. Awesome. <laughs> it, it would awesome. be you know, like you couldn't create a better scenario than if it snowed. Uh, but a drizzly sideways, you know, 47 degree rain, which is far more likely in Green Bay in late April, isn't it? 
But can you imagine instead of giving them hats, you give them a team parka when they come out? <laughs> yeah. And then have it have the real ones. So like, so when it zips up, you yeah. just get the little fur hood, and you're like, I don't even yes. know who that guy is. We just pick. Yeah. But apparently, he's going to stop. You know, some rush and coming around. <laughs> That's the thing. There's a lot of cool places that they could do things with. Whether it's the rush, whether it's the Hudson Center, whether it's what's already existing yeah. your Tunnel Town, and Trevor knows this. I have uh, right on the corner there of Oneida and Lombardi is where one of my best friends in the world lives. He's the one who's got the um, uh, Lombardi trophy carved, uh, sawed, sure. uh, yeah. carved out of the front row. And they have a really big uh, garage because they used to have a camper. So I've told the Packers, like, I can get that spot too because it's bigger than a normal garage. <laughs> yes. like it's, they've got a normal one there, and then they've got a really big one. Right. And so far they've only chuckled at me like maybe I wasn't serious. Yeah. But I think it could come for a song and sure. you can see people in there. But uh, <laughs> it, it is really because in, in this case, you are exactly right. It's as close as they'll come to the Super Bowl. I think yeah. it's most people that will ever come in for some sort of event that really isn't. And I say this yeah. with all seriousness, seriousness, some bowling Congress event. Yes. Right. They've had before. Yeah. Um, I, I and I, I it, it strikes me. I don't even know how many folks will come. It's equivalent. It's going to be a lot. You're yeah, going to have to wait to, to EAA. Yeah, we don't need tolls. Yeah, getting up EAA, but they camp. Right. Yeah. That, so that whole place is filled with campers and tents. Um, yeah, it, it, it's a year away, but it sure is going to be interesting, fun to watch. I'm sure that uh, every broadcast entity in the state is going to, they better plan for it now because otherwise they're going to be broadcasting from Manasha and talking <laughs> about the draft up in Green Bay. So. Yeah. And, and everybody, the people, you know, like people at Augusta are used to their little town. Yeah. And that's what it feels like. It feels like, uh, like Hannah Storm made a great point when we were at the Boston Marathon. Um, it feels a little like Augusta National, this little town and people come in or Wimbledon, which is kind of the sleepy town. And then yeah. everybody comes in and it's got that same kind of mm -hmm. feel. Yeah. But the people at Augusta are used to it coming every year. So they just rent their house out for a fortune and leave. I don't see anybody here wanting to leave. Yeah. Right? Like I could say I'll, that to my I'll mom. I'll rent mom, my house out. Oh, yeah, yeah, house you'll you'll She's like, rent. forget it. Yeah. I'm going to go. I'm 84. I'll never see this again. You right. know, she wants to make up for watching the Packers draft Randy Duncan. She's like, I don't need to see this again. I want to so, see somebody for real. Remember what the Deer District looked like when the Bucks won the NBA title three summers ago. I mean, that's what the draft looks like, but it's, it looks like that for three days. And yeah. it's, it's that times three or times four of what was down in the Deer District. So... It, it'll be an extraordinary watch. I would have zero interest to going, at, like you were mentioning earlier, I would never plan to go to Detroit to see no. the draft. If the draft was in, and it has been in Philadelphia, right, a few years ago, I wouldn't yeah. have gone to Philadelphia for the draft. If I'm going to go to one of these places, I go for a different reason. But, yeah, it'll bring it – is, it is Green Bay Super Bowl. Um, you know, from an on-game standpoint, this is, is probably as cool as it's ever going to be. One more for me as we wrap it up with Mike Heller on the Game Radio Network all across Wisconsin. At an event at Lambeau last night for UWGB, and I met Jeff Halfley. And oh, I asked him, yeah. when he walked into the D coordinator's office, did he take it down to the studs <laughs> just to make sure that this is new? And he said to me, nope, I walked yeah. in, I put my stuff down, and I got to work, right? So yeah. we know that that's going to be affected in this year's draft, but it can't change overnight. So can you just help us, like, Make sure that we don't over expect things, I guess. Yeah. Nobody's going to do that. We're always going to over expect. Uh, yeah. Well, not. We, we want to see dramatic changes, right? Yeah. Uh, the, the defense was good enough last year uh, when it mattered to win. Now, they weren't good enough in the fourth quarter in Santa Clara against the Niners, but they put themselves in a position to win the game had Jordan Love and the Packers' offense acquitted themselves well enough. The defense had done enough to win, right? So I don't know what we're going to see, uh, Trevor, from, from – and I don't know what people want to see. I know what they want to see. They want to see an 85 Bears-type defense. They want to see Fritz right. Shermer's <laughs> defenses. They want to. They want some of that. I don't know that they're getting that, but, uh, it, it, you know, they needed change. Uh, Barry's day was done a while ago for a lot of fans in Green Bay. They were just waiting for the time. So you mentioned that they played well enough because there was one issue that still sticks with everybody because there were three points in there that could have helped if they'd gotten those. 
Yeah. Which brings me to this. This is the last thing I have to go. I pose this. As, as hard as it is, people think, gosh, drafting a quarterback, they reach and it's like it's the hardest position. Harder to draft a quarterback or a kicker. <laughs> well, you're oh, you're 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 on the edge of being over two in drafting a kicker with the. But where was Mason? Wasn't Mason a selection? Was uh, Mason? He, yeah, he was deep down there. He was. Um, but I'm thinking, you know, that like Tampa spent. Remember they? Uh, what was the guy's name from Florida State? Roy Aguero. You know, and he yeah. was bomb, and it took a while for yeah. Janikowski when he was picked to get second to be anything. You know, Chester Markle was a second round pick. He was okay yeah. for a couple of years. I just like every once in a while, people are like, yeah, we really love this guy. We're going to spend a seventh round pick on him. And like, I don't know. I think it's literally harder to figure out if a kicker can play in the NFL yeah. than a quarterback. It's it's uh it's like the building or establishing a new business. Like when you're building one from the studs. The second owner is much happier than the first <laughs> owner on building a business. And that's where you can find – like one of my favorite Packers kickers of all time is Jan Stenerud yeah. because he was going to make everything. And he had already established and he just didn't have leg strength. Crosby's probably still the kicker a year ago if the new kickoff rule was in play last year. Yeah. Right, don't you think? Because his problem is they, they didn't want to have to cover all the kicks and he couldn't get the ball to the end zone. But this year, now they don't want you to get the ball to the end zone. But Mason Crosby, if they'd have had this rule a year ago, yeah. probably still the Packers kicker. Yeah, all yeah. he did was get it between the uprights. Jeez, every a, seem, seemingly every time. Yeah, yeah. What, a, what a horrible thing to be saddled with. <laughs> that is true. That is you, true. You did call that, Jay. All right. Mike now, Keller, thanks okay, for coming so on, before man. We, before we let you go, real quick, yeah, we're yeah, going to have you give us who they're going to pick at every one of those slots. Go ahead. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Let me. I didn't make that note yet. <laughs> okay, so you're. I get it. You and Mel. The final book isn't out yet, but maybe you could call in who we're taking with pick two hundred one in the sixth round later, and we'll just add yeah. that. We'll yeah. run it up. We'll we'll have. Uh, well, it'll be Mike's picks, and we'll just run Put a crawl on the bottom. Yeah, yeah please. We'll, scroll That'd along. Be fantastic. we'll, we'll do I'll that. Send them in. Okay. Trevor, I'll get. I'll get that to you later. Yeah. Uh, text it to me. What'd you think? <laughs> yeah. Mike, good to see you, man. Thanks for jumping on with us. It's uh, fun hey. to chat with you. Thanks for letting me invade your space. It's kind of Appreciate fun. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Doing the right thing. Every time we do the draft special, yes. I feel really stupid because yeah. I think I'm a fan and know what's going on and then Field Yates and Mike Keller and I'm like, crap, I gotta, yeah. I'm just going to listen. Our guys are the ones that I find are really amazing. And maybe I said this after we had Mel Kuyper on the one time. They're so into this. And Mel's my favorite because he'll always say something about a cornerback that is, he's right in the 218, 218 pound range. I'm like, no, 218 is an actual, that's an actual um, weight. You can be in the 220 range. You could be in the 210 range. 218 seems specific. You know, here's Trevor. He comes in, he's six, seven, and three eighths or thereabouts. What is thereabouts if you're at six, seven, and three eighths? If you're going to the <laughs> eighths, you're not about. Like, that's what you are. And they know Fair. all these guys. And then to see our place, that they have video of all these guys. You know, it used yeah. to be, yeah, here's the top 50 and then the top 100. And now we yeah, we we got thousands of clips and bang. Hey, here's Crazy. the St. Thomas third string long snapper. Hang on. We got that. <laughs> but and yet and people gobble it up that's my that's the thing i cannot get yeah. over is how much if if espn literally did a bracket that just said here pick the first 32 guys i i don't, I don't know how many people would go but it'd be to me it'd be i think it'd be huge i don't i mean i think it'd be whole, the problem is people would be like well what happens if you get more right than mel kuyper um, but you know, that happens. People get more games yeah. right in the bracket than Jay Billis doesn't mean they know anything. Um, uh, but I just think that would be a really awesome game to do that too. So, I grew up, then, please. I was gonna say, I grew up memorizing Bible verses and hymns. How do those guys do that? Like, honestly, do, is there like a memory book that you got to go through in order to maintain that amount of information? Cause I can't, maybe they do it. Maybe they do it lyrically, you know, they might. The Chiefs are on the clock. And I don't know, they do a recital like the Lord's Prayer, you know. Doubtful. Our first Doubtful. rounder who art in Kansas City. 
<laughs> Pat Holmes, Patrick Mahomes be his name. And that's oh, how they man. just remember it all when they go through. But it's, yeah, it is something to see those though. guys just rattle off. Yeah. That's what they do. And they know those guys and they go over and over again. And then the other thing is, it's like anything, they literally do so many shows that it becomes boom. And I, like in the last week, I've seen Field, he does NFL live every night. They had a three round draft special with he and, and uh, Mel and Shefty. Um, I literally, literally got off the set on uh, one night. It was two in the morning and I'm walking through to go change my clothes. And of course we got 20. Oh, well, look, there's the ACC network happens to be on. And granted it's a repeat, but at two in the morning, there's field on with the ACC network people talking about ACC draft picks. Hey, how about Drake May for North Carolina? Who, by the way, I don't think could play dead in a cowboy movie. We'll see. <laughs> um, I wouldn't take him, especially given the last, NC UNC quarterbacks that have come out with with uh, Sam Howell or you know uh, Mitchie six points uh, Mitch Trubisky they have they haven't great so I'm not sure I'd be lining up to take old Drake May maybe he'll prove me wrong and that's fine but right now I'm not uh, not so sold here's the thing I find about this though right they're gonna get done and they're gonna on day three here's Mr Irrelevant you know it's gonna right. be Brock Purdy or whatever. <laughs> Which, by the way, I feel bad for that guy because if he'd been drafted one for, one pick before, we'd just say he's a great quarterback. Now he's right. always tied to this thing. But as soon as that's done, Green Bay is on the clock. Yeah, that's crazy. That, and it, then it's hard gonna- to it's hard to picture, right? Because we don't know where the stage is going to be or what the setup is going to be. And anybody that's been to Lambeau knows the area and Title Town and the the Rush Expo, and obviously. Byron's, Byron's garage. garage. Got to have <laughs> right. it over there. I think you should go to B. Fralick's garage, but that's fine. I think that's the hardest part about it right now is because we don't know those things. So we know it's coming. We know there's going to be literally hundreds of thousands of people here. Mm-hmm. Every hotel will be filled 100 miles around Green Bay in the Appleton area. But where, like, where is it going to be? Because once we know that, now we can start to envision how this is going to work and go and and travel and so on. It's our Super Bowl. I mean. The only thing I can remember, John, maybe you were here for this. When the Packers won the Super Bowl, the NFL kickoff party was here on Thursday night mm-hmm. when it was the the team that won the Super yeah. Bowl hosted the NFL kickoff. That yeah. was gigantic. Seas of people. I think Kid Rock played and uh, Maroon 5. And the, the stage was in the middle yeah. of Oneida Street, kind of looking up mm-hmm. towards that. And I wasn't I, I wasn't even kidding about the weather. Like you have to take that into consideration. Is it going to be indoors? Is it going to be in Lambo? Is the atrium going to be the green room? Do you know any of this? Can you please jump in and say you're right on all these things? Maybe, maybe. I can't because obviously no one can predict the weather. Yeah, fair. <laughs> I don't, but honestly, <laughs> I don't it would be that bad. But I might, I might, I might have an inkling on some things. But I'm not at liberty to say. Hmm. Okay. Nor nor would I like anybody to say those things for me. So we don't want to we don't want to get those things out. I don't want you to say anything that you don't want to say. That is not <laughs> what we're doing on this show. You are not saying anything that you anyway, don't want. All I know to is get. like I don't I don't have like a, a, a John Wisconsin as it is, but I can remember when the draft was. Oh my gosh, WBAY! Sometimes they would break in with who the first pick was, right? There would be John Campbell or there was Bill Jarts. Sometimes they would crawl it around the bottom because you don't want to interrupt Young and the Restless or whatever was on. <laughs> you know, that's how we got our draft news. And I remember when they drafted Ron Hallstrom and he moved in across the street from us. And I think he got a big um, uh, feel for what he was getting for because everybody in the neighborhood made a giant sign that put on his garage, welcome, at a hawk, tiger hawk on it. <laughs> said, welcome to Green Bay, Ron. And I think mean, he's like, Oh my God, who who are these people? And these are my neighbors. I think they've just invaded my privacy by putting a very nice, very nice sign on my garage. <laughs> people just still went and put a, they still put it on my garage, you know? That's crazy. Um, so it's, the draft has changed so much from when I was a kid. Um, and and you couldn't get any news. And now it is just gonna be overwhelming. And so the whole, the whole, the state and the city is gonna explode. And, you know, you never know. Hopefully they do it well enough because it's become such a perk that they'll spread around. But it like you wish you'd be like the College World Series in Omaha. Just just come here all the time. This yeah, is where you know. Oh, man. Can you imagine? This is where it is. Let's so do all I know is yeah, there'll be a line at the pro shop. 
you know, yeah, a little bit. You always have that person there with the, the with the with the down mark or whatever it is the the, the old you know like they were in the Next. chain game. Here's the back of the line, right? Funny. You're going to be in the pro shop and you're going to be down there by the dinosaur on Ashland and and Lombardi Avenue. <laughs> That's where the line's going to be. It is hard to envision how this is going to yeah. go. You know the dinosaur. Well, our, our thanks to Field Yates. Our thanks to Mike Heller. The NFL Draft Special. We've done it literally every single year. We've done the show. It's another good one. We're super pumped to see who the Packers take. Uh, and it's springtime here in Wisconsin. So as we end this episode, let's yes. talk real quick about the deeper roots that's coming. John, have you ever participated in making maple syrup here in Wisconsin? Did you guys ever do that back in the day? Uh, no, but every spring I used to tap the telephone poles for creosol. Okay, <laughs> not edible. <laughs> Got it. Well, good news. We didn't tap any telephone poles, but we did tap some <laughs> maple trees, some maple syrup. This is a fun deeper roots there is a huge, oh, huge history here in Wisconsin uh, in making maple syrup. And this family's been doing it 170 years. And it's really good. Deeper roots with our friends at Blaine's Farm and Fleet. Let's make some maple syrup. Pancakes. We've been doing this going on two years now. I'd be willing to bet that this is the deepest rooted story. Talk to me about the process. Maple syrup making. Yeah, we have a flat pan cooker fired by firewood. All we're doing is blowing the moisture off. We're getting the water out of it. You know, Grandpa Joe would always say we're watching Sugar Dance. Farmers, brewers, hunters, packers, badgers, cheeseheads, neighbors. No matter what name we go by, we are bound together by our roots. These are the people, the stories, and the statriotism from inside Wisconsin. Welcome to Deeper Roots with Blaine's Farm and Fleet. Our journeys on deeper roots have brought us to a sugar shack. About time. Springtime is here in Wisconsin. We are with the Breyer family in a sugar shack that is not 170 year old here, but 170 years worth of tradition in your family. Our history went back as far as is my father and our grandfather, but as we dug into it and did the research, we found out that great great grandfather Fred Breyer produced syrup in the Medina Dale area in 1854. And that was documented. You know, they were out doing whatever farmers do in the spring and saw some, some of Native Americans making maple syrup and they said, we can do that. From there, it went to many different places. As the family moved to the Burnwood area, to the home farm, where my dad and my uncle, and, and, and now Doug lives on the farm and Doug is cooking maple syrup in a maple syrup shack right in the woods that grandpa did. You guys are cousins. I would assume that you picked up right where they left off. Grandma was always involved and then we never got to know our grandpa. He died passed before we were born, but grandma was definitely out there and then my dad kind of passed it on to us. When I first saw it really produce and, and got involved was at my grandpa Joe's in Anawa. And eight years old, he's cooking maple syrup. And I said to my dad, we're gonna do that someday, right? My dad goes, yeah, we'll do that someday. And then fast forward to out here, my son is eight. My dad and I are taking off a batch of syrup and Josh says, we're gonna do that someday, dad, right? And now his daughters are out tapping trees. So it's not just multi-generational, it's multi-family, you know, across two different states now. I think there's something special about the way you guys do this and it's that's been done this way for 170 years. I'd be willing to bet that this is the deepest rooted story that has come our way. When we walked into the sugar shack here, in this room, there is just a plethora of things that you can tell weren't made yesterday. Everything in this room, somebody in your family touched. Everything. Everything. And I would imagine there might be a few things, you know, from the farm too. Even this building's a historical building that the family bought and we rebuilt. And this building goes back to being made in the 1890s. You have a, a wood burner. Yeah, we have a flat pan cooker fired by firewood. All we're doing is blowing the moisture off. We're getting the water out of it. You know, Grandpa Joe would always say we're watching sugar dance. Because as they boil in, that sugar comes up and raises up in, in plumes of sugar. And the plumes start changing to be golden, amber, and it just, it's a continuation. It was a thing that we did every year and grew up doing that. And it was a way to, well, once stay out of trouble, but also to build the stories, you know. <laughs> we got a ways to go. We're still white pluming. The boils, you know, we got white steam here. But the boils you can't see is where you really watch it. It's better than TV. I think you should teach me how to make it. You want to walk us through the process? You're not going to give away any family secrets. Oh, well, there's no family secrets. There aren't any? No. You're telling me everybody boils eggs in syrup? This ought to be entertaining. Hello. 
tell me about this. You guys boil eggs in there. You boil hot dogs. A little sticky here, Jay. A little sticky. That's fine. You do this too? Oh, yes. Yeah. It's yeah. how our grandparents ate. It's how our parents mm -hmm. ate, you know? I'm a hard-boiled egg fan. Is this going to be, like, super sweet, I take it? Um, I think you might notice a difference. Yeah. Okay. A little story about Grandpa used to be it when staff season came in the springtime of the year, Grandma and the rest of the family didn't see him much because he took a carton of eggs, a sack of potatoes, and his fish bowl and went out to the sap shack. Hmm. He didn't come home until he needed more food or to help with chores. It's almost smoky. Yeah. Is that what you're going for? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You throw your baked potatoes in the fire and... Uh... Happy Easter. All right, teach me the way, would you? Tapping time, the maple tree that's in your front yard, and I can see here that you've uh, tapped it a time or two. How many years have you been getting sap out of this very tree? 30 plus, 35 years maybe. It doesn't harm the tree. No, it doesn't. Tell me about what you need to do now to, to get the sap out. Well, as soon as you drill a hole in the tree, it's just like cutting your skin. It immediately starts healing. So we're really conscious of where we tap, we find some good healthy wood. We're just tapping inside the bark, that's where the sap wood is. We tap west, south, and east because that's where the sun warms up. So we just pick a healthy spot, and what we're doing is slight angle up, and we drill in. We drill deeper so we have stability for the spile because the spile will hold the weight of the sap. And now, well, we're going to put the spile in, and the spile is just the collector of the sap coming out. We're catching the sap coming up from the roots because it's taking the nutrients up to the buds, to the leaves. So we have a small hole in the bottom, and that's where the sap comes up. And we just tap that in there. Officially tap. Officially tap. And you hang the bucket right here. Hang the bucket. Come back with us running and collect it. Cover it so you don't get stuff in it like leaves, bark, rain, chipmunks, raccoons, random yeah. cats. Yeah. Deer. No, no cats at deer. Deer? Yeah, I bet you deer love it. Oh. All right, sugar shack it. Let's go. And the idea here is boiling it down. Is that just the best way to put it? Just boiling water is what we're doing. And it's the process of getting to the boiling point. And as it gets more dense, the boiling point is different than the boiling point of water. 212 is water on a normal atmospheric day. Maple syrup boils at 219 degrees, seven degrees above the boiling point. We gravity feed from the tank into the pans and transfer it forward and when it becomes maple syrup, we pull the pans off and we filter it in the filter tank and then take it inside the cookhouse to finish it. How many gallons are in here right now? Probably about 15 gallons of sap. Yeah. So this would probably make less than a gallon of syrup. How many gallons of maple syrup do you end up producing at the end of the year? We made 35 this year and 55 last year. And what about you? 27 this year and around 30 last year. But we've been as big as where we cooked up to 100 gallons on the open pans. You guys need some canning jars? They're in the way <laughs> in the basement. It, there's a season to this, true? True. And generally speaking, it's things are very early this year. Seasons years ago used to be 10th to 15th of March to 10th to 15th of April. There was trees being tapped in early February all over. You also have to watch out for if the frogs croak twice after the killing frost. It's going to be a good season, not early. But if we have an early sap moon, we could have an early season. For the sugar to properly be released, we need to have a certain amount of daylight in a day. And then it happens around the 15th of March. Would you say about a frog? I'm not letting you get away with that. You say if the croak frogs twice. The frogs frog croak croaks. twice what? after the killing frost, you're going to have a normal syrup season. That's what my grandma Avis told us. We're talking about the fall now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What are the ways that you get rid of all the maple syrup. Friends and family, since we rent our trees, we don't own all of our trees, we always give syrup back. Some markets like uh, yard sales or produce sales and things like that, but word of mouth. What does it mean to you guys now to kind of continue to pass on a legacy? Just imagine if somebody sees this or hears this, a parent or a child, and they can say, I can do that. I got one maple tree. I can put one tap in. I can get one quart of syrup. And then next year, I could maybe do four. Wisconsin last year was the fourth largest maple syrup producer in the United States. It's all the little guys that are, are tapping, you know, a tree that they borrow from a neighbor or a tree that they find on their land. But when you look at the jar and go, I did this, it's all natural, nothing added. I made this with my own sweat and tears and lessons learned, I made this. As if there was any other way to end an episode, we eat. Thanks for letting us tell your family story, guys. This has been really cool. So let me just make sure that you guys get what you have coming. There you go. This will be mine. Okay, <laughs> I'm just, no, 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 no. What's in your stack of pancakes? 
after making maple syrup for a month, month and a half. Um, usually there's no maple syrup or pancakes here, me Mark. But yeah, just two is fine. <laughs> two is fine, all right, grab one for yourself. There's, there's always a... Oh, yeah. It's kind of like opening a can of Miller Lite, I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> and a little goes a long way, or no? Use as much as you want. All right, taste test time. <laughs> mm-hmm. There's not gonna be a single one of those left. I don't even want to talk anymore. You guys go ahead and close it out. I'm done. Really, really cool. I mean, this is about as deep rooted of a story as we've told on Deeper Roots. Just want to say thanks. Thanks for having us out. I mean, 170 years. That's what Wisconsin is. It's just a whole bunch of deep rooted stories that we all live and we think they're worth telling. So thanks again. All right. Peace out. We'll see you next time. I'm good. Mm. No, really eat. It's good. You probably should eat. Do it. Come on now. I'm 6'8, man. That's a long way down. Oop, going over. <laughs> Obviously, we don't worry about FDA licenses when it comes to this type of stuff, but I mean, what is the end game? Oh, we invite people to do podcasts. <laughs> Here we are. Um, Spile. It's called a sp Or if you want to go old school and Canadian, spool. Oh, hey. How many gallons of sap you make have to have? I don't even know what I'm saying anymore. Let's just eat some pancakes. Big fan of pancakes with that Wisconsin maple syrup, courtesy of the Breyer family and 170 years of legacy. Thanks for having us out. A special shout out to Paula, who submitted this incredibly deep-rooted family story on the website, farmandfleet.com slash deeper roots. Jay, Doug, the whole family, it was great to see and meet you guys. If you have a story you'd like us to share, head to that website just like Paula did, farmandfleet.com slash deeper roots. If you're watching on YouTube, like us, subscribe, let us know what you loved in the comments below. And if you're listening on the podcast side, go ahead and leave us a five-star review there as well. See you next time. Talk to you later. Bye. Remember to subscribe on YouTube, leave a review, smash the like button, just get with us. The Inside Wisconsin Show is brought to you by American Family Insurance, Aaron's Company, Blaine's Farm and Fleet, Capital Credit Union, Festival Foods, Quick Trip, Miller Lite, North Star Mohican Casino Resort, and the University of Wisconsin Platteville. <laughs>